Welcome to another GED lesson with Mrs. Lynch. Today we are looking at perspective and context, two very important social studies concepts. So just as a little brain exercise to get us started, where are we in this picture? What type of room is this? Look at the picture closely for a second and see if you can figure out where we are. If you guessed that we are inside of a violin, you are correct. While it looks like we're in some sort of theater or maybe an attic, this picture is actually taken of the inside of a violin. And that would be a good example of perspective right there. So I've got a quote I'd like you to look at. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. This was said by L.P. Hartley, who was a British novelist. Don't worry, you don't need to know anything about him for GED. I just like to give credit for quotes. So the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. What does that mean? Think about it for a minute. The past is a foreign country they do things differently there. This is a really good admonition to keep in mind when we're looking at history. See, all too often when we look at the past, we want to judge it by the same cultural mores and morals, same ideas, philosophies as how we live today. We expect people in the past to be just like us, because after all, they're people, and we have a pretty good perspective on what we think people should be like. But the fact is, the past was incredibly different from today. So this is where that issue of perspective comes in. We have to understand that people have not lived the same way throughout history. Things that we value today might not have been valued at a different time in the past. Things that we don't value might have been quite valued. Um, for example, the role that religion plays in your life is quite different for today from what it was like in 1600. Or ideas about marriage are quite different. This may surprise you, but at the founding of the United States, there were actually no laws about how old a person had to be in order to get married. And the very first marriage laws in the United States stated that a child should be about six or seven before they could get married. That's wildly different from today. And you'll see perspectives different in all sorts of areas of life. Ideas about beauty. Depending on where you look in the past, fat women are much more beautiful than thin women, or vice versa. Sometimes long hair is beautiful, sometimes short. In the 1920s, girls wanted to have a very boyish figure, and the short hair cut close to the head. And then you look at the 1950s and women are supposed to be bustier and that cone bra is really fashionable. If you've ever seen it, it's quite wild. Um, the hair is very, very feminine in the 1950s. And you look at the silhouette of the clothing, broad hips, narrow waist. But in the 1920s, that would have been considered ugly. What they thought was pretty was a girl going straight up and down, no curves. So let that be a warning to you when you're studying about the past. Don't judge it too much by today. Perspective changes over time. And with that, let's talk about this issue of perspective. So uh, to start with, I've got a little question for you. Can a map be racist? Now you probably have a knee-jerk reaction, yes or no. But I want you to think about this a little bit more deeply. So if you need to, pause the video and contemplate this question. Can a map, in fact, be racist? All right, I'm not going to answer this question, but I want you to keep this question in the back of your mind as we look at perspective through the lens of maps. Now there's a problem with maps. Earth is a sphere, but maps are flat. So when you're taking a 3D sphere, it doesn't flatten out perfectly. What happens when you try to make a sphere go flat is you're gonna distort certain shapes. And this is a problem for map makers. 
So the map that you're probably the most familiar with seeing is this Mercator projection map. And you probably didn't know that that's the name of the map, but it is. This map is a super old map, still shows up in school textbooks to this day. And boy, is it riddled with problems. Nothing is where you think it is. And nothing is the size you think it is. The Mercator projection was designed by a Flemish geographer and cartographer whose last name was Mercator. That's where it got its name. And it was designed in 1569. So if you think back through history, 1569, what do you think was the major motive for having maps in 1569? Who needs them and what do they need them for? Well, if you took a guess that it has something to do with colonization, you're quite correct. Now you notice how the center of the map is Europe, because Europe is basically the center of the world. And you see how Africa is very accentuated, and so are the Americas. This map is to aid Europeans who want to cross the ocean because they want to either go down to Africa to take part in the slave trade, or they want to go to the Americas for raw materials or possibly for transporting people. Mainly, this is a map that's going to be used by people that are doing some form of trade, though. It shows north is up and south is down. It basically gets the shape of countries and continents correct, but the size is incredibly wrong. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Here's another attempt at showing a map of the world. This is the Gall Peters projection map. You might have seen this one in school, uh, but I would imagine a lot of you probably didn't. The Gall Peters projection map attempts to solve that issue of getting the size right. If we look back at the Mercator map, it looks like Greenland is huge, doesn't it? Greenland, in fact, looks bigger than Africa. In actuality, Africa is 14 times the size of Greenland. So this gets the size of Africa right. Africa is also larger than North America. In the Mercator map, Africa looks like it might actually be smaller than North America. Notice what else is different. I'm going to flip back and forth again. You see how some of those little islands are actually not so little when you flip back? But the problem with the Gall Peters map is it gets the shape wrong. It has to distort the shape of different areas in order to get the size right. And so that's potentially a problem. Doesn't it look kind of weird to you like the whole world just got stretched? Here's another attempt at getting the map more accurate. This is what's known as the Bonn projection. It might surprise you to know just how old this map is. This actually dates back to the 1500s. So the heart shape makes it a little bit easier to get things right at the center. But when you go to the poles and move outward, it gets less accurate. Here's another attempt. A team of Princeton astrophysicists designed this map. And again, they were trying to figure out this way of how do you show the world on a flat surface, get the size right, get the shape right, and also get the position right. So those are a lot of factors to have to show when you're going from a sphere to a flat surface. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, on the Mercator, and the Gall Peters, doesn't it look as though Antarctica just stretches forever and ever, and it's this long thing that takes up the entire bottom of the map? But that's not accurate. If you look at this map by the Princeton astrophysicist, Antarctica is way off to the right side, and notice it's one body of land that takes up part of a pole. It's not this long, flat thing that stretches on forever. 
The size of Antarctica gets greatly distorted because it's at the top when you're trying to put the globe into a flat surface. At least it's the top of most maps when we try to design them. Now here's another attempt at map making. This is known as the orthography projection. The orthography projection was created by a Japanese art architect in 1999. To date, this is the most accurate projection in the mapping world. Now, it looks really weird, and it looks like there's a whole lot more continents. The reason is, this map is kind of based on the idea of origami. It can be folded various ways to show things accurately. It gets the positions right. It more or less gets most of the sizes right. A few of them are off. This is one way you could fold that orthography proje projection. And you see how the lines of latitude and longitude are not perfectly straight. And again, that's because you're taking a sphere and trying to flatten it out. And if you draw them perfectly straight, that's great for a ship that wants to cross the ocean. But it's not so great if you want to actually know the right size and position of everything. And you see right away how much bigger Africa is in particular than you're used to seeing. Australia also looks larger than you're probably used to seeing, and Antarctica looks much, much smaller. So here's a question for you after looking at maps. How do you think size distortion impacts our perspective? As I've mentioned Africa, this is the true size of Africa. Do you notice how huge Africa is in reality? Now on the typical maps that we're accustomed to seeing, Africa ends up looking smaller than Greenland. But look at how many countries can fit inside Africa. I mean, China only takes up the bottom part of Africa. The United States could fit in the top with plenty of room for some additional friends like Spain, France, and Germany. What do you think that does to our perspective when a continent like Africa is consistently shrunk on a map? So think about what images or words do we associate with size? Well, in fact, there have been studies that have shown that when things are depicted as larger, we tend to view them as more important. When they're depicted smaller, we view them as less important. So how might that affect a continent like Africa in our view. Look at this projection here. So the actual position of Greenland is here in the yellow, but look if you projected just Greenland as it is over the size of the US. You see how small Greenland is actually compared to the United States? But on a typical projection map, Greenland looks huge. It gets greatly distorted. And look at what happens to the size of Greenland if you moved it down to the equator. The poles tend to distort size. When you see Greenland at its, its actual size, you tend to notice it less. Or here is Russia in its normal position. But look at if you positioned Russia on the equator, how much smaller it actually is in real life than what it looks like on a flat map. Basically fits the span across of Africa, but Africa is in fact much larger. Russia seems so big, imposing, and important on a typical flat map, but when you move it and see its actual size in relation to other places, it seems to lose a little bit of its importance. Or to take another example, here's Indonesia. So Indonesia in the pink is where it normally is, where it, it actually is. But if you were to move Indonesia to one of the poles on a map, the size would get distorted. And what you would find is that Indonesia is actually the same width across almost as all of Russia. Indonesia is huge, but on a map, it looks like a series of tiny islands. Do we perhaps value it less because of its size? That's actually a question that people ask and study to find an answer to. Or to give you one more example, India in its actual position in pink, 
If you were to juxtapose it over top Africa at the pole, you see how the size gets distorted, but it gives you a better idea of the actual size in relation to Russia. India is much, much larger than you typically think it is. So does that affect your perspective on it at all? What about position? How does position impact our perspective? So here's our typical map. How does the position of the countries impact how we think about them? What happens to your perspective when north and south change places? This is still a perfectly valid map. The decision to put north at the top, south at the bottom, that was a decision made in the early Renaissance period slash late Middle Ages, around the 1500s. And the decision was made because it was easier for European sailors. There's absolutely no reason for north to be at the top and south at the bottom. We could totally reverse them if we wanted to. This is a perfectly valid map. But what does it do to your perspective? It's kind of bewildering, isn't it? Try to find the United States on this map. Or if you want a real challenge, try to find where you live. Try, try to find your home state. It's quite complicated, isn't it? Because your eye wants to go to the normal place where it looks, and this map is bewildering because nothing is where you expect it to be. It's an example of looking at something through a different perspective. Look at what happens if we put Australia and Indonesia in the center of the world. Here again, it kind of plays with your mind trying to find where you live in relation to this. But also, doesn't it make Australia and Indonesia feel more important because they're now in the center? And it kind of makes the US and Canada and Europe all feel less important. Here's another question for you. What are other ways a map could show perspectives? So we've looked at size, we've looked at position, flipping north and south. What are some other ways you might show perspective on a map? Think about that for a second. Do you have any ideas? When I ask about this in classrooms, a lot of times students will come up with the idea of color. Maybe you could use different colors to show some form of perspective about countries. All right, so that's a possible idea. I'm gonna show you a couple different. So this map, this is a real map, the Bunting Clover Leaf map. This is a uh, German map. This was drawn by a German pastor and theologian, Heinrich Bunting. This map, was depicting his view of the world. Now, he didn't literally think that the continents were shaped like this, but he's showing his perspective about the Earth. This was drawn in 1581. And again, he is a Protestant pastor and theologian, as well as a map maker. So look in the center of the map. What does he view as being the center of the world or kind of the most important part of the world? If you look very closely, you can read Jerusalem. So he sees that city as being so important that he literally considers it the center of the world. He then views Europe, Asia, and Africa as all connecting in some way to that crucial city. <clears throat> if you look, he also depicts specific places in the continents that have importance to him. Um, for the most part, these are Christian cities at that time. So they would have had some personal significance to him from a religious standpoint. And America is way off in the bottom corner on the left. It doesn't really have very much importance to him, so he doesn't bother to portray it. So this map tells you a lot about this particular man's view of the world. Let's look at another map that shows perspective. This is a British map, and it's showing the British Empire in 1886. It's quite interesting. So where you'll find a perspective being expressed is not so much in the map itself, but what's going on all around it. 
Now what's going on in the map itself is showing different routes to get between these different colonies that belong to Britain. But look off on the sides, let's get a little closer. How does Britain portray itself? Can you find a portrayal of Britain? Now we're looking at the people at the bottom. Which of these people is supposed to be Great Britain? If you guessed the person who's sitting on top of the world, you're correct. So you see how Britain is depicted as the goddess Britannia. She holds a trident and she has a shield. She's literally sitting on top of the world. What are the British saying about their position in the world by this piece of art? They're literally saying they run the world. They're the most important. And at this time in history, they were pretty much right because they controlled more than a fifth of the globe. So yeah, they were pretty significant. And if you look around Britain, you'll see portrayals of all the different colonial subjects gazing adoringly at Britain. Get a glimpse of the other side. It's a very interesting map, isn't it? All right, let's look at one more. Can you tell what country's perspective this map might be showing? You might have looked at the characters written on it and guessed that maybe it was Chinese or Japanese. And you'd be pretty close. This is a Japanese map. So this Japanese map is showing the Great War or World War I. And it's showing you a Japanese perspective. The different countries are depicted as objects or animals. So what do the Japanese feel about Russia, for example, based on this map? Well, if you look, Russia is depicted as this sleepy, lazy bear. It's huge, and if you look at the bottom of its shoe, you can see where it basically stepped on another country. So it shows that it's a bit of a clumsy oaf and doesn't care who it hurts. And it's just kind of lounging there. That shows the Japanese, they see Russia as potentially dangerous, but at the same time, they don't have a lot of respect for it. Because again, it's, it's a sleepy bear just laying there. It's not doing anything. Look at their perspective of China. They depict China as a pig. So I, I think we can all safely guess how they feel about China at this particular time in history. Um, if you look at Japan itself, look close. Can you tell what Japan is depicted as on this map? It's a little bit hard to see, but Japan is actually depicted as a samurai or a soldier. Then if you look down at the right corner, you can see America. America is depicted as this gentleman with his top hat and he's got a spyglass. Where is he looking? He's looking specifically at the islands in the Pacific and little bit into the Indian Ocean. Um, so he's looking at areas like the Philippines and Indonesia. Now why Japan would depict America as looking at that specific area is because that's where America had colonial possessions and Japan was interested in those same colonial possessions. So Japan is actually depicting America as a potential threat to their future expansionist goals. And of course, you keep looking and you see even more perspectives about various countries. And you also see some countries where Japan doesn't really seem to have an opinion, probably because those countries don't really have anything to do with Japan's goals and they don't pose a threat to Japan. It's an interesting map, isn't it? All right, so let's switch gears and talk about context for a few minutes. So what is context? Context is everything that is going on at the time in other words, everything that's going on at the same time as whatever it is that you're learning about. So events, key people, ongoing processes. It's also things like the values, the cultural mores, or you know what's normal, beliefs, trends. Those are all important. So in other words, it's the background. It, it gives you the history behind something. It helps you to understand an event correctly. So when you're looking at context, you want to look at parts as well as the whole. What I mean by that, 
let's say we were looking at September 11th and the attacks on the Twin Towers. If we just take that completely out of context, it doesn't really make sense. We wouldn't have an answer, for example, to why that event happened. And if you take it out of its context, you might not understand what events led up to it. It could look like it just happened for no reason at all, and that wouldn't be accurate. There was a reason. And for further context, you would want to understand, you know, not just the reason behind it, but maybe what did those towers represent? What did the United States represent? What other events were going on in the world right then that would inflame such fury against the United States? So context gives you the whole story. Why does it matter? Well, without it, things just don't make sense. You can also reach completely wrong conclusions about events, cultures, people, etc. Like, let's say you were visiting South Korea and you went to visit one of their palaces, which they have quite a few palaces throughout the country. And you go to this palace and you see that it was rebuilt multiple times. Well, if you don't have any context, you might reach the conclusion, oh, the Koreans are terrible builders because this thing kept falling down and they kept having to rebuild it. But if you had the historical context, then you would know they had to keep rebuilding this because Japan and China kept invading and tearing it down. That's why it had to get rebuilt six, seven, eight times. Or to give you another example, this is from my own family history. My grandfather only reached grade three in school. Now you could just look at that and say, wow, her grandfather wasn't very smart or he was lazy or he had terrible parents. But if you look at things within context, you would realize actually he was growing up during the Great Depression in the American South. His family were sharecroppers. They didn't have money. They needed him to work so that the family wouldn't starve to death and so the family could keep a home. So context really, really matters. Let's take a look at an example from history. All right, so here's our first example, King Henry VIII and his wife issues. So Henry VIII, King of England, was married six times. What the heck was wrong with that man? Now, you completely divorce this from context and you probably think, wow, was he a player, or wow, he must have been hard to get along with. And actually, both of those statements are pretty true, but there's something much deeper going on. So Henry VIII married six times, but why? Well, the reason he kept remarrying is because he needed a son. He desperately needed a son. Um, and of course, as we know, that was actually probably his fault and not his wife's fault. But he kept remarrying in the hopes that he would get a wife who could produce a male heir. And he did have one male heir who was illegitimate. And then he finally had a son from his third wife. But that son was kind of sickly. So he kept remarrying in the hopes of getting another one. And to put it further in context, why would it matter so much? Well, it mattered because he was king shortly after a massive civil war that had ended with his father taking the throne. And his father had been kind of a compromise king who kind of sort of had a legitimate claim to the throne, but he wasn't a perfect candidate. The civil war had killed both of the actual heirs, and so they were kind of having to dig a little deeper to get an heir to the throne which meant his father didn't have the best claim on the throne. There were other candidates who also could have been king. So Henry had a lot of pressure. He's got to have a son to secure his family line and make sure they keep the throne. And if he can't produce a son, people are going to look at it and say, well, maybe he wasn't supposed to be the king in the first place. All right. Another context, and we'll stick with the British because they're kind of fun to talk about. So Britain just got a new king, King Charles. Charles III, to be exact. His name is of great interest to historians. Why? I mean, his name's Prince Charles, so why not King Charles? Well, if you look at the context of British history, Britain has never really done well under King Charles's. The first King Charles got his head whacked off because he tried to be a tyrant, 
and he had a bunch of arguments with Parliament that resulted in him losing his head and being charged with treason. So, you know, that's not a great forebear. And then King Charles II was basically a party boy who restored the English monarchy after a period where they went without a king. So the new King Charles choosing to go by that name instead of a different name is kind of making a statement about the sort of king that he might be. And that's why a lot of people were kind of concerned or just intrigued when he chose to go by that name, Charles III, because context. So let's use context to help us analyze a couple of documents from U.S. history. All right, here's this photo. Nice photo, right? All these guys kissing and hugging the girls. So if you just look at this photograph with no context whatsoever, it's a nice photo. But if I were to tell you that this is from World War II, what does that context do to the picture? Well, the, the picture's still a nice picture, but it's kind of a sad picture now. Because what you realize once you know it's from World War II is that these are men getting ready to go serve in the military and they're saying goodbye to their sweethearts or their wives. And some of these men are not coming home. So see, the, the context really changes the story, doesn't it? The context adds depth and it tells us what's really going on. All right, here's another photograph. So this is a photograph of the U.S. Capitol under construction. This is when they were working on building the famous dome on the Capitol. And so it's kind of a cool photo right off the bat, right? I mean, you probably haven't seen the U.S. Capitol under construction. And it's kind of neat to see what it looked like before the dome was up. But the context makes this picture even more interesting. Because why was this photo taken? What's going on? Why are all these people gathered at the steps of the Capitol? Well, the year is 1861, and they're gathered to inaugurate a new president. Any idea which president this would be in 1861? If you guessed Abraham Lincoln, you're correct. This is the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, his first term in office. So we are practically mere moments from the Civil War breaking out. I mean, this is the, the last kind of peaceful moment of a somewhat unified country you're going to have, and then there's going to be years of war coming after this. And what's also interesting to keep in mind is Abraham Lincoln's going to be assassinated later. So this is only a few years before this man dies. And you think about all that's going to happen from the moment this photo is taken until the last breath of this particular president. It really makes the photo a whole lot more interesting when you know all the story. All right, lastly, I'm going to show you a collection of dolls from over time. Let's think about the context of when these dolls were made. These are Barbie dolls. All right, so here's the very first Barbie doll. She comes from the 1950s. So in context, this doll is meant to be a fashion doll. She's meant to represent feminine beauty and, you know, the ideal of what a beautiful woman should look like. So you notice how her eyes and her face are done. Her makeup's very different from the Barbie doll you're more familiar with today. And you'll notice her hair's a bit different too. Now this is Barbie in the 1970s. So the beach culture is a big cultural influence in the 1970s and kind of that uh, easygoing California culture. And so Barbie is very suntanned now. She's not so pale. Her makeup is different. Her bathing suit's quite different. Uh, and her sunglasses are completely different. Now here's a Barbie from the 1980s. Now in the 80s, culturally, that was a decade when a lot of American women were joining the workforce and there was this idea of women being able to be working mothers and more jobs being available to women. And so now Barbie is portraying herself as an astronaut. Now it's not to say there wasn't still Barbie in a bathing suit. There were those dolls as well. Barbie has a huge wardrobe. But 
it's interesting that starting in the 80s, one of her possible outfits is an astronaut outfit. Of course, it's got to be done all in pink, though, because apparently that's the only color little girls are allowed to like. And our final Barbie doll comes from the early 2000s. So this was when Mattel decided, having been pressured by people for a couple decades, actually, that they were going to make Barbie dolls that had a more realistic body type. And so this Barbie is meant to be a better depiction of women in the early 2000s. Her outfit's quite casual. Um, and as you can see, her body has changed significantly. And so has her overall look. So here again, Bar Barbie is this representation of the culture that creates her. And the culture is different over time. Do you see how when we know the context, then the doll makes a lot more sense? There's actually a story behind them each. Well, hopefully this was helpful in helping you to understand perspective and context, and hopefully you found it interesting.